Thank you for joining us today. It is my honor and privilege to introduce our keynote speaker, Professor Nikos Makris. Uh, Nikos Makris is a full professor of cognitive psychology at the Democritus University of Thrace, which is located in the area where the wildfires have been raging set for several uh, days now, causing death and destruction uh, to lives and nature. First of all, Nico, on behalf of every, everyone here, let me express our deepest condolences and sorrow for the loss of lives, properties and forests. On another tone now, Professor Macris is an expert in the field of consciousness and learning and he joined us to, today to share his insights on the fascinating topic, Consciousness as a Compass for Navigating Learning in Uncertain Times. In these rapidly changing and uncertain times, the pursuit of knowledge and learning is more crucial than ever before. As we face complex challenges and navigate through uncertainties, understanding the role of consciousness in the learning processes can serve as a powerful tool to guide our decisions and actions. Don't worry. Professor McChrystie's research and expertise in consciousness bring forth unique perspectives on how our awareness and cognitive processes influence our capacity to learn and adapt. By examining the relationship between conscious, consciousness and learning, he sheds light on how we can harness our mental faculties to uh, tackle and under, uh, to tackle the uh, unique challenges that surround us. Before I call our distinguished uh, speaker to the floor, allow me to say a few words about Nikos, who happened to be a long time close friend of mine, as we know each other from our college years, and uh, that is almost a quarter of a century ago. <laughs> Nikos Macris is a professor of cognitive psychology. In the earlier years of his career, he has worked extensively on topics such as theory of mind, metacognition, problem solving, and executive control development of preschool and school aged children. In the recent years, his research interests focus on the development of children's knowledge about consciousness and their understanding of the representational nature of the human mind. His research has also offered cross-cultural evidence for constraints on, on conceptual development and other dimensions of cognitive development. Results derived from his research have been published in prestigious journals such as Intelligence, Cognitive Development, Behavioral and Brain Sciences, Human Development. His expertise on, conscious, on, conscious, on consciousness uh, unfolds in a book he authored with the title uh, Philosophical, Psychological, and neuroscientific approaches of consciousness. Regarding other sides of his illustrious career, Professor Nikos Macris has been the editor in chief of Psychology, the journal of uh, the Greek Psychological Society. He has been in charge for uh, five years, and many of us can attest that he has, and his team have uh, done a great job in raising the status of the journal. Last but not least, Nikos has been serving uh, the national community of uh, psychologists for several years as a member of the, ex of the executive committee of the Hellenic Psychological Association and since last year as its president. As I said, it is my privilege to be a friend of Nikos for many years and we have shared many precious moments of our academic and personal lives. This is why it is not only an honor, but also, also a great joy for me to chair this keynote. Nikos, 
on behalf of, the, of all the conference organizers and the attendees, I extend our deepest um, appreciation for accepting this invitation to spend half of your uh, summer holidays preparing for this talk. I know that for fact. We look forward to enlighten us with your wisdom and vision of how consciousness can be a compass for navigating learning in uncertain times. Let us give a warm welcome to Professor uh, Nikos Matis. Dear Maria, thank you very much for the scientific and also personal introduction. Indeed, it has been over 30 years since we have known each other. Since then, many things have changed and many things remain constant. For example, some of us became old, but others, like you and Eleutheria, remain young and active as we were then. This is one of the few certainties that have been prevalent for the last 30 years. Dear Eleutheria, dear Maria, thank you and also dear Ribault for this honorable invitation. Thank you also for the excellent and generous hosting. I think that every board should be proud for its decision to entrust you to organize the conference. Dear colleagues, dear friends, it is a great pleasure for me to be here today and to have the opportunity to discuss with you the role of consciousness in learning in uncertain times. Both the title of the lecture and Eliot's phrase suggest a journey. This journey is to the land of learning with consciousness as the navigator. In fact, it is a mental journey to the conscious mind that has the ability to overcome uncertainty, to learn, to improve, and of course to adapt to the environment and the continuous demands and phrases. Like any journey, the one we are going to take together requires some supplies and has some stations. The supplies are actually theories from the field of psychology, philosophy of mind, and neuroscience uh, that uh, refer explicitly or implicitly to either to consciousness or to learning or to the relationship between the two. As for our stations, we will start from the land of learning, and after nine stations, we will return to the place where we came from. Let's start our journey. Learning, aspects and functional role. Learning is closely related to human existence. It involves the relationship between the individual and the continuously changing environment and includes the ability to acquire new knowledge, to acquire new forms of behavior, to enrich or modify existing knowledge or behavior. These dimensions of learning indicate changes in an individual's mental representations and behavior as a result of experience, practice, or exposure to the environmental stimuli. In this respect, the aim of learning is to equip individuals with the tools that they need to navigate successfully, make meaningful contributions to society, and continuously grow and develop as individuals. As for the features of learning, learning is a continuous process that occurs throughout the person's lifetime. This continuous character of learning is linked to neuroplasticity, that is, the brain's ability to change and reorganize itself. Through learning, one overcomes ignorance, uncertainty, and thus adapts to the demands and challenges of the environment. Learning involves the construction of mental representations or mental models that allow the individuals to understand and interact with the world. Close 
possibly related to the above characteristics of learning is the fact that learning changes the experience of the learned object. If indeed learning involves extensive representations about the world surroundings, this means that the experience of the same materials is in, the, in a different way after learning. Learning also involves a social dimension, as it often occurs through social interactions, formal or informal. In summary, learning is a lifelong and continuous process that enables individuals to adapt, grow and thrive in a dynamic world. From a cognitive psychology perspective, learning is a dynamic and multifaceted process that involves the, the active engagement of various cognitive processes. One of these processes to which learning is linked is consciousness. Although learning starts very early, it is generally accepted that effective learning begins with a conscious experience. This is known to every parent, to every teacher who has tried to teach a distractible child. In everyday life, this is, the precise, this is precisely the meaning of the, term, of the term attention. It involves an attempt to control what will become conscious. In this context, Ronald Bars raises the question of whether consciousness is a necessary condition for learning. This is an interesting question that is, also, but that is surrounded by controversy just because the zero point of consciousness still remains unknown. However, either consciousness is a necessary condition for learning or it is not, and it is just, and if it is not, it is just a, a helpful agent, it is very difficult to deny that uh, in the real world consciousness and learning are very close companions. Just before I referred to the term adaptation as a result of learning, but how does adaptation occur? Adaptation is essentially is essentially a cyclical process. This is what Ronald Barr's term, cycle of adaptation, implies. It is in fact the cycle that signifies the relationship between a new knowledge, we often, uh, 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 sorry, that signifies the relationship between learning and consciousness. This cycle involves three phases. In the first phase, and in learning a new knowledge, we often begin with a considerable uncertainty and confusion. In this phase, past experiences or present conditions influence behavior. By paying attention to the problem, a sense of clarity is achieved as we become conscious of what is to be learned. The attempt to understand the new input information makes the context of learning more informative. For example, new input information serves to reduce uncertainty with the new, within the new context. Finally, through practice, the material becomes highly predictable and fades from consciousness. Obviously, consciousness is mainly involved in the first two stages, but in the first one, the input is so well defined that we are not truly conscious of it as such. Consciousness of the input as such is limited to the second stage, the information stage. The stage. In the first stage, through which learning and by extension adaptation is completed, the conscious object becomes redundant. Therefore, consciousness seems to be linked to learning and even to guide. But how does guidance occur? Is consciousness a one-dimensional function? If not, which aspect of it affects learning? Is this effect similar to all ages or does it vary according to the age of the learner? These questions will be answered to the next stations of our journey but before that, we need an intermediate station. 
to define consciousness. Even though much has been written about consciousness in recent decades, many, many consider consciousness to remain an enigma. This is partly due to the fact that due to the difficulty of defining what is meant by the term consciousness. From time to time, and in different sciences, consciousness has been defined in different ways. Consciousness as a wave state, consciousness as perception, consciousness as mind, consciousness as a system of executive control that supervises and coordinates the activities of the whole mind of brain and consciousness as experience. When my younger daughter was at uh, her nine years, she asked me how it is like to be you. I mean, how it is like to be the other person. I could never understand it. Uh, Aphrodite, like uh, a little Thomas Nagel, with this question, best captures the meaning of consciousness as experience. It is a meaning of consciousness which gives more emphasis to the inner world of the individual rather than to the external world of the ability to persist stimuli. Apart from the meaning of the term consciousness, much debate is developed in recent years about the levels of consciousness. In this talk I adopt the distinction between primary and reflective consciousness. Primary consciousness is the direct experience of perceptions and emotions, thoughts and memories, which is expressed as an immediate reaction to these mental and or emotional states. Sensory perceptions and emotions are the most rudimentary aspects of consciousness and the in animals and the infants who have not yet mastered speech. Reflective consciousness involves thoughts about consciousness, conscious experience per se. In primary consciousness, the individual is the subject who experiences the thought experience, while in reflective consciousness, individual conscious experience are the object of the thoughts. Associated with primary consciousness are first order representations, the results of neural computations of the constituent sensory properties of objects, that arise from perception and are necessary to guide action. Reflective consciousness, on the other hand, is associated with meta-representations, the ability to represent the representation. Although this distinction between primary and reflective consciousness sounds new, however, already in the early years of the emergence of psychology as a science, these distinctions was already stated. Specifically, William James, in providing a detailed description of consciousness, gave emphasis on reflective consciousness of the self and identified it with thinking itself. This approach of reflective consciousness is close to the meaning that Vygotsky gave to the term consciousness. In his verse, we use the term consciousness to denote awareness of the activity of the mind the consciousness of being conscious. Even though for this early theories consciousness and its investigation uh, have been considered as the central issues in psychology, during the 20th century, in the behaviorism era, the traditional subject of psychology was neglected. Indeed, if someone reviews the psychological literature of the last several decades relevant to the awareness that individuals form about personal mental states, they will face a great difficulty in detecting the term consciousness. However, there is a paradox. Even though there is not any reference to consciousness, there are extended descriptions of various aspects of or dimensions of the subjective experience and all the mechanisms that underline its demonstration. If someone asks Henry Wellman to give a comprehensive description of theory of mind, the answer would be that theory of mind is an every manifestation of awareness that individuals form for the representational character of the human mind and to an extent 
the subjective character of the human mind. If also someone asks John Flavel to give a simple description of the term metacognition, he should respond that metacognition refers to the awareness of the functioning of the mind that is derived from the control as well as the monitoring of the way that mind works. Despite the apparent similarities between these two descriptions in conceptual level, the two traditions remain for many years distinct and unconnected. I will next argue that theory of mind and metacognition are both aspects of consciousness and thus they study in the field of psychology is actually a study of consciousness. Evidence for this link can be identified at various levels. Let's start for the links in conceptual level. Pernet the DMS some years ago suggests that some higher order thought about one's own mental states, that is theory of mind, is required for conscious awareness. Also, they argue that the behavioral outcome of theory of mind acquisition, that is the distinction between self and other, reflects actually the core meaning of consciousness. Evidence for the link between metacognition and consciousness can be identified also at various levels. Monitoring and control as the components of metacognition are related to consciousness. Subject, subjective monitoring is one of the properties of consciousness as consciousness does not, does not uh, refer simply to knowledge itself but to the awareness about this knowledge. On the other hand, control is related with consciousness as without consciousness some loses the control of their own actions. Also, absence of deliberate control is related to no access to consciousness. Let's proceed to the links in terms of executive control. Central to Vygotsky's view of cognitive development is the interconnection between child's acquisition of voluntary control of an action and the consciousness of this action. In his verse, action control and consciousness of that action are the two aspects of the same code. Successive four belief styles for clarifying the link between theory of mind and executive control is linked to the inhibition of one's own representation of reality and the taking up the, the, the other's representation of the same reality even when this representation is false. In the field of metacognition, metacognitive control is seen as closely related to executive control. This is an idea that is, it is well documented in a series of neuropsychological and neurobiological and neuropsychological studies that unfortunately I cannot be now to present. Talking about consciousness, one cannot but make reference to language. In my opinion, the relationship between consciousness and language was stressed in a particularly fascinating yet clear way by Vygotsky. Consciousness is reflected in a world like the sun in a drop of water. A world relates to consciousness as a cell relates to an organism, as an individual relates to the universe. A world is the microcosm of human consciousness. Recently, actually this year, uh, in the neurobiological model proposed by Skipper, it is stressed that what distinguishes humans from other mammals is not consciousness in general, but higher order consciousness, the reflective consciousness. What contributes to the transitions for primary consciousness, which other mammals also, poss also possess, to the higher order consciousness that allows awareness of the surface language. As for the relationship between theory of mind and language, quite informally, quite informally, are many studies, among them the meta-analysis conducted by Millikan colleagues. 
This meta-analysis clearly, clearly demonstrated that there is a significant relation between various aspects of language, syntax, general language, semantics, and semi vocabulary, and false belief understanding. As for the link between metacognition and language, a Fides has already pointed out that language allows a child to integrate gained experiences with mental state. Language also provides a means by which mental states and processes become objects of learning. In summary, we consider that tone and metacognition are two intertwined aspects of consciousness, and that each of these aspects, like consciousness as a whole, are closely linked to executive control as well to language. The main idea about the relation between tone and metacognition presented in this station is also supported by the findings of the study that just has been recently that, are, that has, has been recently completed in our laboratory in the context of a PhD thesis of Dimitra Economaku, uh, Dimitra is somewhere here. Hello Dimitra. The data, research data from both the field of theory of mind and the field of metacognition inform us about the development of consciousness of conscious awareness. It is this data that support the argument of the functional link between theory of mind and metacognition. We may not know what the zero point of consciousness is, but we know what the most crucial point in its development is. At the age of four to six years, children acquire through a theory of mind the metarepresentational nature of mind. But consciousness is not a dichotomous process. This crucial point in its development emerges during gradual, emerges gradually through a series of individual achievements. At their first year, children present a minimal level of consciousness characterized by their implicit ability to differentiate self from the others and to build an implicit sense of self. At their second year, children form a first level of self-consciousness. They begin to recognize the self in the mirror, use personal pronouns, show awareness of system of actions they demonstrated before, and restore the sequence between the representations of the past and the representations of the current action. Also exhibit, exhibit awareness of mental action. They are aware that someone who saw where an object was hidden will look at this other place as indicated by the play look pattern. At uh, their uh, three years, children have awareness of the rule that perception leads to knowledge when one saw an object, one knows about it, and awareness of their own performance. All these achievements prepare the ground for the acquisition of theory of mind that took 4 to 20 years. At the next stage, children are explicitly aware of mental representations of their own actions. For example, at this stage, they differentiate between easy and difficult memorization tasks. However, at this age, children do not explicitly differentiate between mental functions like memory and reason. Uh, uh, children between 8 and 12 years are able to estimate accurately the similarity and differences of mental processes activated. At this point, let me briefly to show you the results of a study indicating children's awareness of cognitive functions. This study involves students from 9 to 12 years. Or, after solving tasks corresponding to different domains of thought, verbal, quantitative, experimental, and imaginal, participants were given a series of descriptions of cognitive skills and thus to answer whether they used each of these skills, describing the relevant statements when processing each of the different tasks. It is worth pointing here, pointing out, that participants' awareness scores were, were a function not only of their ability to choose the most appropriate cognitive processes, but also to inhibit the inappropriate ones. Keep this because we will discuss it later. 
Participants were also tested with a series of inhibitory control tasks. The results saw that participants progressively became able to affiliate each particular cognitive skill with the domain of thought to which they theoretically corresponded. Uh, follow the blue line that indicates that children from their 10 or better from their 11 years are able to affiliate the verbal specific skills with the verbal cognitive tasks and not but not to the other type type of tasks. Interestingly, participants, and these two figures please follow the yellow line, participants were with high executive control found to make more accurate affiliations than participants with low executive control. Returning to the development, adolescents form accurate maps of mental functions and their own strengths and weaknesses. As a result, they evaluate their own performance and cognitive tasks with increasing accuracy. For instance, they know where in school they are strong and where they are weak. Also, they recognize that it is easier to execute mental rotation than to calculate mathematical relations. This metacognitive awareness allows children to regulate their learning effectively by allocating their attention and effort based on their understanding of their own capabilities. A crucial question is which is the functional role of consciousness in cognitive development? The answer to this question, together with the available evidence about the development of consciousness that we already saw, may show us the role of consciousness in learning during development. However, in order to fully understand the relationship between consciousness, awareness and learning, it is necessary to have a theoretical framework that includes principles of cognitive system structure, approaches consciousness as an integral part of the cognitive system, and allows specific predictions to be formed regarding the functional relationships among all aspects of the, of the cognitive system. Such a theory is that of developmental priorities theory that I have worked in both for the last 30 years with other colleagues, some of whom have been present here today. What I need to stress here is that the theory postulates that development goes through four developmental cycles from birth to adolescence. Several studies during the last decade on the basis of this theory try to reveal the role, of con the role that consciousness plays in different development. Of all these researchers, I have chosen today to present you briefly and for the first time results for an extensive longitudinal research project because something was completed two months ago. In this project, to test consciousness, participants were examined on their awareness of similarities and differences between mental processes. They were asked also to infer an observer's knowledge based on an actor's activity, seeing, hearing, shopping, and to solve first and second order theory of mind tasks. Almost 500 children and adolescents, approximately equally distributed, across the ages from 4 to 5 to 17 years, for example. What we, see, what we will see are the results from the first wave of cross-sectional data collection. As we see in the slide, in the representational cycle dominating the preschool, early consciousness awareness, that is uh, comprised by first-order theory of mind tasks, awareness of the similarity of difference between simple cognitive tasks, emerges primarily for attention, control, and language experiences which are acquired during the cycle. Remember the relationship between executive function and language that first Vygotsky has had pointed out. A cognitive factor associated with processes acquired in later presentation at cycle Seeing forms of detective reasoning, first level of Raven test of mathematical and special problem solving, was repressed on the representational awareness factor. A consciousness factor associated with abilities acquired during childhood and is level based on awareness of cognitive processes, second part of the of mind tasks, was repressed on the cognitive factor representing the acquisitions demonstrated in the school age. 
A cognitive factor representing that sequence inside could was regressed on the, on the consciousness factor representing the, the awareness achieved during the cycle, but also to a working memory factor. A consciousness factor associated with awareness of cognitive processes acquired through the adolescence, awareness of, cogn of complex cognitive processes, were regressed on the root based cognitive achievements, second order Raven matrices, mathematical and special problem solving. And finally, the cognitive factor demonstrating the cognitive achievements during adolescence uh, was regressed on the principle based consciousness. In fact, that figure illustrates two important issues about development. First, the dynamic interactions of the aspects of the cognitive system, and second, and more crucial for me, the mediating role of consciousness in development. In this slide, Consciousness is both the cause and the effect of development, providing an answer to the crucial question regarding concerning the role of consciousness in development. Several training studies examine whether training conscious awareness accelerates transitions across phases in the way it does in spontaneous development. I will present you briefly two relevant studies. The aim of the first study was to investigate the effect of explicit teaching of summarization as a cognitive strategy and the self-questioning as a metacognitive strategy on the enhancement of reading comprehension of sixth grade students and the possible perseveration of this, of this improvement through training two months later. Seventy students of the sixth grade participated in the study. All participants were initially tested with the reading comprehension test. Based on their performance on this test, they were divided into three groups, low comprehension, mid comprehension, and high comprehension. Randomly, three groups were then created, one control group and two experimental groups, with the main criteria that each of these three groups should include equally students from the three levels of comprehension. One experimental group trained in summary writing and the other in the self-questioning strategy. The control group followed the typical school curriculum. After the training was completed, all participants were tested again with a comprehension test and also their ability to write summary and self-questioning. This, this testing was repeated through different tests two months after the training was completed. The results show that in the two experimental groups, its, uh, its figure uh, shows, uh, represents low comprehension, average comprehension, and high comprehension. Uh, in its figure, its set of um, bars represents the performance of control group, experimental one group, and experimental two group, while the yellow represents uh, the uh, the, the free testing well. The results show that the two experimental groups, irrespective of the training they receive, improve in text comprehension. Also, both improve in strategy, in the strategy in which they train, but also in the strategy they were not trained. A finding that support, that suggests that the, the transfer of training from the cognitive level to metacognitive level and vice versa. An interesting finding is that participants with different levels of test comprehension in the, at the initial testing were found to benefit differently from the training. It is not worthy that students from the lowest level of comprehension risk, this is the low comprehension, risks, risks during the second wave uh, of testing, the, uh, the level of performance that initially corresponded to average students, to students with low or with middle comprehension. The second study 
aimed to investigate the effect of framing metacognitive awareness on the accuracy of describing how to solve mathematical and verbal tasks and on improving performance in these tasks and in executive functions. In the first phase of the study, 150 students, aged from 10 to 12 years, were tested individually in solving mathematical and verbal tasks, while during solving, as on the basis of the thinking allowed method, the description of how to process a task was recorded. Participants were also tested with random tests and with a series of, a series of uh, tasks addressed to executive uh, functions, working memory, division, and sitting. Then the participants were distributed randomly in three groups, one control group and two, ex and two experimental groups. In the second phase, the participants of the two experimental groups were trained systematically in metacognitive awareness strategies with one, the one experimental group being trained through, through mathematical tasks and the second one through verbal tasks. In the third phase, all three groups were pre-tested with the tasks used in the first phase. The results show that framing the metacognitive processes led both experimental groups, irrespective of the tasks on which they were trained, to improve performance on both types of tasks. The second pattern calls true for the improvement in accuracy in describing how to solve the task through thinking aloud method. An interesting finding is that the training led both experimental groups to improve working memory and then accuracy in the inhibition and sitting tasks. But, this is interesting, not to improve reaction times in these tasks. In other words, training improved, to improve not the sufficiency of executive functions, but their efficiency. The metacognitive training for all participants to exploit their cognitive potential as reflected in their performance on inhibition and sitting tasks. Moreover, both experimental groups increased their general IQ by seven points in average. In conclusion, the training in metacognitive awareness improved not only awareness per se, but also transferred to the improvement of significant other cognitive processes such as executive functions for the absorber and general energy. All the above evidence shows that at different developmental phases, different levels of conscious awareness are acquired. This led us to the argument that learning must capitalize on consciousness in developmental specific way. In preschool age, education must build awareness about conceptual origins of knowledge and facilitate mapping actions to the object and their representations. Uh, in preschool age, goal focusing must be the priority. Children must be given mental goals to guide their actions, exercise to stay aware of them, and systematically keep search alignment and mapping processes tuned the goal until it's met. Mental states are not observable, but they are the object of reflection through language. Therefore, teachers should encourage students to make explicit, uh, sorry, to make explicit their awareness of any mental state, any phenomenon, social, physical, or biological, by talking about it. As early as in kindergarten, children can be asked. How do you know that? Are you sure? Did you think about it or remember it? Are you sure you understood it? Such questions help reflection, monitoring and control of mental action to occur as they allow things to be expressed in a metacognitive way. In primary school, children must be guided to become aware of their available cognitive processes and strategies. They must realize that they are these processes are tools of task management and problem solving. Many times, in achieving a goal, there are many alternative means of reaching it. In these conditions, the most effective strategy or process to achieve the goal should be selected. However, for effective learning, not only the appropriate strategy has to be selected, but maybe more importantly, the inferior strategies have, have to be inhibited. Needless to say, that the relinquishment of non-productive strategies is linked to executive control, as recent studies in the field of conceptual states show. Stellar studies during class decades uh, support this idea. 
One way to develop students' executive control is to ask students to explain the processes or mechanisms they use to meet a task. Such questions reduce certainty uh, about the student's opinion or choice decision. In late primary school and in secondary school, training must focus on the reflection of outcomes of their efforts and to the evaluation for truth and validity of the decisions they make. For example, when they are involved in problem solving. Also, at this phase, self-monitoring must be explicitly practiced to enable registering and representing personal mental strengths, strengths and weaknesses. At this age, at that age, students benefit from reminders, think twice, or even more explicitly, think about what you are saying, how do you know it is like that, or are there other possibilities? Awareness development is, not, is neither a unitary, not zero, one achievement, and gains are not simply achieved. Rather, it requires sustained investment of effort and vigilance in setting that value, this effort, and where individuals themselves can see the benefits of their investment. Beyond an environment rich in new, varied experience that serves, that serves as a receipt for cognitive development, most broadly, what it is like to foster awareness development? The answer is simple. Science autonomy. Unfortunately, the experience of choosing how to structure a project or choosing the project itself is like in today's classroom. Structured tasks that allow for a limited number of responses remain the norm in the classroom. Such types of tasks limit students' autonomy. Providing opportunities for students to practice their autonomy is precisely the, great, the goal that teachers could adopt, given the broader goal of supporting students' development that results in stable management of their own thinking, both independently and in interaction with others. A little while ago, I presented a study showing that training in metacognitive awareness during problem solving involves both performance of various tasks and the efficiency of uh, the executive functions. More interestingly, it's also improved that the accuracy in the description of the way that was followed during the task processing. However, training on something is linked to its effective teaching and learning for each level. The logical conclusion then is that awareness of cognitive processes not only influences learning, but also influenced by it. Thus, we argue that conscious experiences, experience save learning and learning save conscious experience. The crucial question is how are awareness states learn? Quite recently, Clermans gives an answer to this question integrated principles from the theory of higher order thoughts, the theory of uh, workspace and the principle of representational description is proposed by Camilo Schmidt. On this basis, Clermans proposes that there are three interactive groups that define the dynamic of a core representational description system in which the first order network, the framework, the framework in white blue, uh, mapping the perception to action constitutes input to the higher to a higher order network that in, in light yellow the task of which is to represent first order states in order to serve other goals, such as monitoring first order states and dynamics and preventing future states. Two further loops augment this core system a perception action system loop that extends over interactions with the world and ensures awareness of the world, and the first order loop that extends over, reaction, over interactions with other agents. This third self loop is actually the scaffolding that makes it possible for an agent to redescribe its own activity to itself, as now she is endowed with an internal model of what it takes to be an agent distinct from the world, but also distinct from other agents. In this respect, the relations between awareness about the world, self-monitoring, and the distinction of self and that from the other, the so-called theory of mind are complex, interwoven, and loopy. They are strongly interdependent between each other. The processing carried out by the inner loop 
depending on the existence of the both, the perception, action loop, and the self other loop, with the entire system thus forming a recurrent hierarchy. Thus, continuous experience, what it feels like to have mental states, is the results of the continuously operating representation and prescription processes, the goal of which is to enable better control of action through the anticipation of the consequences of action or activity of the mind itself on the world and on other elements. From this perspective, consciousness is the minds or brains implicit embodied in active theory about self. In other words, we learn to be conscious. This learning is an activity driven by action and its conscious outcome extends inwards, the mind learning about self, and future out and further outwards, the mind learning about other minds. The phrase at certain times at first gives you the feeling that it has a negative connotation. However, we have seen in the description of the learning style, the learning cycle, sorry, that uncertainty is a feeling that allows, is a feeling that always accompanies the learning processes in its initial steps. In this respect, uncertainty, uncertainty, especially when it has a conscious element, not only does it not have a negative connotation, but on the other, but on the contrary, it can act as a motivation for learning. If now this uncertainty does not relate to the initial feeling during the process of learning, but spreads to the long term and to the conditions in which one lives and develops, this meaning is still not a negative, but a hopeful one. In a certain times, consciousness is linked to awareness of uncertainty, Consciousness allows us to be aware of our surroundings and our emotions. And expanded consciousness can encourage us to think beyond immediate circumstances. It might lead to questioning assumptions, consider alternative perspectives, and foster incompatibility in the face of uncertainty. Heightened consciousness might prompt individuals to seek stability and order in a chaotic world. This can lead to the exploration of practices or beliefs that provide a sense of security and structure. Exploring one's consciousness during uncertain times can be a wellspring of creativity. The history has shown that artists, writers and creators often draw from their inner experiences to generate new perspectives and insights. As for learning in uncertain times, Uncertain times one often bring about changes in various aspects of life, including war, technology, and societal norms. Learning new skills and knowledge enables individuals to adapt to these changes and stay relevant. Learning fosters resilience by equipping individuals with the tools to navigate unforeseen challenges. It provides the ability to find alternative path, paths, think creatively, and problem solve effectively. Learning can serve as a constructive distraction during uncertain times. Engaging in learning activities can provide a sense of purpose and achievement, which can contribute to mental well-being. Learning can foster connections with like-minded individuals, both in person and online. Engaging in learning communities provide a sense of belonging and support, even when physically isolated. In summary, both consciousness and learning in uncertain times are powerful ways not only to survive but thrive. They enable the individual to face uncertainty with a proactive and positive approach, empowering them to contribute to their own well-being and the well-being of their community. Our journey into the world of consciousness-based learning is almost at the end. On this journey, we have, in fact, adopted a lead paraphrase, Ziegler's suggestion. It may be possible to recite the observations of Vygotsky, Kuhn, Carmelo Smith, and other insightful observers of children as a generative database for broad ideas 
about characteristics, tendencies, and qualities of children's thinking. Now, we have come back to the place we came from. And we are able, now, to see this place in a new perspective. We actually realize that we need two things to fully understand the phenomenon of child's learning. First, a unified theory of child's learning that is needed to be compatible with the characteristics tendencies that we can discover in children across all aspects of their cognitive development. And second, to grasp of what it is like to be a young child if we allow ourselves to wander with them a bit, then we may begin to see the world from their eyes. Please allow me an emotional reaction. This presentation is dedicated to those who saved my house from the wildfires in Alexandrovoli while I was here at the conference. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much for your excellent prepared talk. Um, I like it very much. Um, actually, I have a question or maybe um, a comment on the definition of um, learning and knowledge. So, um, at least for motor learning, at least for motor learning, so when we think about uh, behavioral improvements, not cognitive issues, uh, really, uh, there's propositions that motor learning is actually also steered by implicit processes, so the processes that are unconscious. So learning can occur, occur via these, these processes. Um, meaning that consciousness is not always involved in, in learning and uh, changes in behavior. What I found interesting is your remark on, um, on the um, importance of, of language, so uh, it, that is mediating basically executive functions. And that's also something that is very relevant, I think, in motor control or motor learning. Um, when you learn to balance, I think most neuroscientists would agree that consciousness is not so much involved in steering this process. But when you learn something more complex, like um, javelin throwing, juggling, um, uh, things that are, require executive functions, then the question is, how important is uh, the is language in the acquisition of that skill. So does it play a mediating role in, in acquire this movement? Um, and it, this has implications for, for, for a, a pedagogical perspective in schools. When we think about how we teach young children, especially when they're very young, instructing them what they should do with respect to these functions, um, we assume that they understand and then basically they uh, mediate their behavior based on the, on the on consciously driven actions, so intentional actions that they uh, perform. And it is not yet. Can you conclude to your question? Yeah, yeah. I, so my point Thank is, you. yeah, my point is really, um, I think the role of language in the acquisition of, of complex skills is not yet clear, and uh, I think that's a very important, interesting point that you made. Is there a question about the question? Yes, there is a question. Okay, thank you. Uh, Professor Bosniano, please, can you pass the microphone here? Thank you for your very interesting and stimulating talk. Congratulations. Um, you mentioned I agree with you that very strong relations between consciousness, theory of mind, and metacognition. 
But I'm not sure, are you equating this, these terms? Are you saying that they're, that, that they're the same? Because when we're talking about consciousness, it's the same. The theory of mind. But where, where are the similarities and where are the differences? I think there are, I'm, I'm, I wasn't sure from your talk whether you thought that you equate all of those or you're making some distinctions. Uh, thank you for the question. It is a quite difficult uh, question, and it's difficult to give an answer. But I will try. Um, firstly, I support the idea that the that metacognition and the theory of mind are linked to the reflective consciousness, but not to the primary consciousness. As for the second and more difficult part of your question, if I identify these aspects with consciousness, I will be honest with you, uh, taking the risk. Yes, I believe that theory of mind, especially theory of mind, is close, even if not identical, to reflective consciousness. Yes, I believe that. But, ah, uh, to add something, in the definition, in the recent definition of theory of mind, there is stress that it is awareness not only for the other mind, but also for one's own mind. So, this recent definition of theory of mind includes what previously was the content of metacognition. Well, I, uh, I'm returning to, the, to my answer. Yes, taking the risk, in my, uh, in my mind, theory of mind is closely related, if not identical, with a higher level of consciousness, the reflective consciousness. But I think, I'm not sure how the audience will, would see, would realize that. I feel that uh, uh, it's too early for the community, for the scientific community, to accept that. <laughs> I will support my argument with reference to the evolution of humankind. Theory of mind came into evidence during the era of Homo Heidelbergensis. At that era, some aspects, uh, not exactly vocal, but in terms of gestures or figures, language aspects was arose. And this is, according to Tomasello and uh, anthropologists, this appearance, this emergence, are uh, actually the step in the history of human being before the appearance of consciousness. The next type of homo, the homo sapiens, that follow the homo hypergensis, is the one who express, get thought, and express consciousness. This is my answer. Uh, yes, please, there is a question. Uh, the, uh, hand there and uh, then the lady on your right. Thank you. Uh, thank you for a great presentation. And forgive me that very basic question. Uh, my question is, what, is what, what are the differences between consciousness and cognition? Uh, as uh, 
I saw in the seminar slide um, some, some theories identified consciousness with mind itself, but and maybe with cognition itself. Cognition is something broader than consciousness. Consciousness is part, maybe the most crucial, maybe the most important, but it's part of cognition. It's not identified the cognition with the word cognition. Cognition involves uh, various mental functions, memory, attention, influence, language, problem solving. Maybe it's one, each one of these functions is connected with a level of consciousness, but consciousness is a part of cognition, but not cognition itself. Uh, I, I think a lady on the right is uh, asked for a microphone. Thank you. Thank you very much for this valuable lesson for all of us. Uh, I wonder, uh, is it time to integrate in the curriculum of uh, elementary schools, high school, university lessons uh, like meditation or uh, mindfulness uh, in order to help uh, students and people in general to come in contact uh, with their consciousness and uh, find a uh, way uh, uh, to be in touch with the inner self. Maybe uh, is it the time to differentiate and uh, take another path uh, in the education and uh, um, uh, not uh, uh, will not be only the distribution of knowledge, but uh, uh, to enhance uh, people to find uh, their inner qualities and uh, abilities. Thank you. Yes, uh, let me clarify that when someone speaks about the meditation, actually uh, she refers to art of state. Uh, it is necessary to be clarified. Uh, given this point, uh, personally I think that it's a very good idea for introduce lessons of meditation at our schools, and not only at schools, at our everyday life. Yesterday some close friends proposed me to have meditation so as to be relaxed before the uh, uh, knows, so as to to isolate my anxious self from my other self and to be more effective today. So the answer is yes. <laughs> Can I take the opportunity here to say that uh, in the conference, in the building, in the, in the venue of tower building, there is a prayer room, you know, a room for prayer for those who believe, for meditation, for those who just want to isolate themselves and relax. And uh, I was informed that this is visited by several people the whole day. So if you want to do an in situ experiment of about uh, consciousness and, and uh, meditation and experience it yourself, you can look for the prayer room. And as I know, we have also yoga lessons that at 6.30 in the morning, But it is forbidden for me. 6.30 in the morning. Uh, please, the uh, lady here, and then I'll be seeing you on the night. Thank you for an enlightening uh, presentation. Uh, my question is, in its current development and also uh, future potentials and progression, do you see that machines may develop consciousness at some point in the future? Oh, really? I really thank you for this question. <laughs> I really thank you. Well, a system with consciousness is an autonomous system. 
that has the skill, the ability to control and monitoring itself and has the ability to self-correction. If the, 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 the machines we have been developed until now are of course capable and have many, many skills and abilities, but they are directed by others. They are programmized and directed by a person. Until now, they are not self-controlled and directed. I am not sure that humanity will be able to create, to construct a machine that would be self-directed. My wish is for humanity not to manage to do that. Thank you for your talk. I don't have a question, I just had a really, really small comment on the meditation part. Um, because a lot of people confuse meditation with mindfulness, and they are quite different. Um, because you, you mentioned meditation as an altered state uh, practice. Uh, but on the other hand, mindfulness is a very close related to self-awareness and to consciousness practice. Um, and coming from a more a clinical side of uh, psychology and education also, I'm a very big supporter of mindfulness and its use in improving self-awareness uh, and self-consciousness in the current state, in the here and now. So I, I strongly believe that it's also closely connected. And uh, providing practices in mindfulness in schools, there's a lot of research going on now but, uh, with mixed findings still, but, uh, we are waiting for the next studies to see how my friends can help both uh, students and teachers as well. But I think it's a, it's a really interesting and promising road uh, towards improving self-consciousness, self-awareness. Um, and I will look forward to, to more findings on that topic, but I also want to know your view of that. So, thank thank you. you for the clarification. Here. Thank you, Professor Matthias, for this insight, for your talk. Thank you very much for that. Uh, just a question. Uh, talking about theory of mind, I'm returning to Professor Kuzniadu's uh, comment. Uh, you mostly focused, if I'm not mistaken, uh, on ascribing mental states such as extended beliefs. Right? It was a false belief task in your research that was used. So I was wondering, um, what about the affective dimensions of theory of mind? What about its links to understanding emotional affective states of others? What about uh, uh, the affective reactions uh, regarding the self in a social surrounding, with regard to self-conscious emotions, for example? And what about the links of consciousness to morality in this wider model uh, of consciousness. Self-conscious emotions also bear moral, uh, have moral implications. So what about the role of effect? That, that is my, my question. According to William James, consciousness, one of the characteristics of consciousness is the aboutness. Consciousness is, only, is always about something. Uh, it is not only for mental states, it is also for uh, emotional, for social, for whatever. Theory of mind in its development and according to the relevant uh, literature is awareness about mental states, is awareness about emotional states, is awareness about uh, social, uh, social skills of certain others. So I don't think that uh, actually I'm supporting the idea. 
Uh, I don't think that uh, it is far from the meaning of, uh, of uh, consciousness. Uh, but, but it still remains a still discussion, an open discussion, whether really consciousness is uh, identical to the other mind. Uh, I thought that uh, I was taking a risk saying that. But it's a great, great, uh, an open debate that needs further elaboration and discussion research for be uh, sure for that. On the other hand, I am not sure whether it's necessary to uh, identify the one with the other. Is there any other question? Yes, the first one that I really don't want to ask. Hello, hi, good morning. Thank you. I'm sorry, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, sorry, please, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, thank you very much for this very insightful talk, and thank you for bringing up uh, what I think we all believe is a very important concept for learning, which is consciousness. Um, you also talk about how to, about the importance of forcing uh, this construct um, and, and ways to do so. Um, I w and you talk about self-questioning, right, as a, as a strategy to foster a student's uh, consciousness. I wanted to, to also ask you, do you uh, believe that uh, motivation uh, might be also necessary, like a previous step uh, to, to sort of uh, foster this this is skill, and if so, uh, do you believe that um, intrinsic motivation might be actually the the the, the you know the aim for for it, or either intrinsic and intrinsic could could work? Uh, <clears throat> consciousness is not the only function that uh, affects or intervenes to, to learning. Motivation, of course, is one of the most crucial factors that uh, uh, help the enhancement of learning. As this is for the first part of your question. As for the second part, I would like you, I, I, please, to, I will ask you please to, to say it again, the second part. Uh, yeah, what I was wondering is, um, in order to foster um, consci like the students' consciousness, um, like sometimes I believe, yes, targeting um, metacognitive yeah. uh, skills might not be um, might not be that effective because perhaps students need yeah. first to be motivated to actually want to self ask those questions, right? So uh, just by telling them you should ask yourself uh, to, to think twice and you should ask yourself to think over about uh, what you are trying to solve as it's very like high um, cognitive demanding task requires uh, uh, that kind of like more and uh, requires even motivation uh, sort of. Uh. Uh, well, uh, I presented two training studies that show that uh, it is possible to foster or to improve awareness. And especially the second one, what I, I, I didn't have the time to, to mention, uh, the, the training uh, was happened in groups. This is adds another feature in, the, in our training. Actually, it happened in a collaborative framework. So, if you, as a teacher, 
follow some specific steps and some specific techniques like the question, like uh, asking questions like those I saw. Uh, then you can improve and foster children's awareness. Actually, uh, this way of training is is close connected to the zone of proximal development proposed by the government. <coughs> if you uh, follow uh, step by step, if you accompany step by step the student, and uh, your mind, teacher's mind, guide student's mind, it is for me the most effective way so as to improve the awareness and improving awareness actually you improve you improve performance. Right, thank you very much. And one last question by Professor Matalido. We have a <laughs> Nico, uh, thank you for your inspiring talk. Um, this talk remembers me, uh, our talks, uh, 40 years ago. <laughs> uh, so uh, I would like to ask you uh, if you, um, or your opinion, uh, if an interaction with uh, internet or machines uh, can affect uh, our consciousness or um, I prefer the stream of consciousness. I like uh, the definition by James. Uh, because um, internet is um, an unlimited source. Uh, it is our cloud mind. And, uh, and sometimes we believe that um, we have the, um, the abilities or the capabilities <laughs> of the internet. So uh, how this can affect our consciousness. I mean, we, consciousness. we believe that consciousness. we almost know everything like the internet. Consciousness can affect its use. What I mean, uh, teachers and parents' aim for me should be to teach or try to inform or try to make children understand uh, where the good implications, the good implications of using internet stops and from where the negative implications of it starts. In other words, uh, consciousness in terms of uh, critical thinking, because critical thinking is related to awareness, high level of awareness, is a crucial point for a good and uh, effective and uh, 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 pleasant yes. use of internet. What I mean is that uh, children must be aware of the negative and positive implications of that and to be in the position to choose the appropriate sources of internet. Thank you. Thank you, Nico, for this uh, talk in a very interesting and uh, a challenging issue. As a developmental psychologist myself, what I have kept from this uh, talk is that Conscious, consciousness is the source and the result of development. Yeah. Hope we are all, are all developing in a mature and conscious way. <laughs> ladies, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Let's